Hello and welcome to Derby, the dead centre of England. My name's Richard Felix and eight and a half years ago I started the now legendary Derby Ghost Walk around the centre of Derby. Over the past 2,000 years this place where Derby lies has been a crossing of the ways. Lying as it does where Highland meets Lowland at the lowest crossing point of the River Trent and its tributary, the Derwent. It had always been a crossing of the ways, the crossroads of history. From medieval times, Derby was the assize town, and any crime committed in any part of Derbyshire, if you were caught, you were brought to Derby. We had five jails, five prisons in the centre of Derby, two town jails, and three county jails. Here at Derby we had the last hanging, drawing and quartering to take place in England in 1817. We had the last pressing to death to take place in England, the only peer of the realm to be hanged for murder. Derbyshire's only female martyr burnt at the stake. Three witches executed at Derby. Some of those jails are still preserved and of course some of the sites of the others are still around and they are all very haunted sites. I think it may be something to do with Derby's location almost in the centre of the country and the number of ley lines, lines of communication and power lines that were used by prehistoric man that has made this place one of the most haunted places certainly in England, possibly in Europe, hence the name, the dead centre of England. When I started doing the ghost walk, people used to say frequently, will we see a ghost? And of course I used to say, no, no, you won't see a ghost, not on a commercial ghost walk. How wrong I was. And most of the things that people have seen they're seen in here, in the jail. I think it's because of the amount of death and torment, anguish and terror that actually took place within these walls is probably the reason why it's as haunted as it is. One or two of the stories we've got that I'll, I'll tell you now. Um, we had a lady on a Crown Derby ghost walk, the staff of Crown Derby, and she came in the corridor and as she was walking in, saw the figure of a man standing, staring at her, with wide staring eyes. I took them all in, there were 17 of them, took them to the condemned cell. They were standing in there while I was talking, when one of them clutched at the throat, and the others seemed as if they couldn't breathe. Four of them ran out of the building, which upset me because I thought, why aren't they listening to what I'm saying? And it's only when I got out and found one of them in tears outside, they re I realised that something had happened to them and they couldn't breathe in the condemned cell. And this lady that had seen this figure couldn't stand it any longer. I said to her that we thought it was one of the jailers and she said, that was no jailer. He was the most evil man I've ever seen in my life. She said he was a murderer. That was over three years ago, and that lady has never plucked up the courage yet to actually come back here and lay her fears to rest. And to bring the whole thing up to date, May the 29th, a year ago, a gentleman emailed us the day after the Friday Ghost Walk, and he said, I have ventured this by email to save the embarrassment of disbelief. I was on your ghost walk last night, and at the end, as your guide was finishing off, there was a figure in black hanging behind him, slightly suspended from the ground, and it was very gently swaying backwards and forwards. I thought it was one of your lads acting daft, until I realised that no one else was giggling. No one could see it but me. And he went on to say, could you tell me, has anyone else experienced anything like that in here? And we emailed him back to tell him that they hadn't. But what we did do was send him a copy of 
one of the reports of two prisoners that hanged themselves from the wood above the door in the condemned cell. The jailer found them hanging the following morning and brought in the surgeon to bleed them, to revive them, so they could hang them later that day. Inside the Abbey pub now with the um, Chris and Simon Myers, the landlord and landlady for the last 12 years or so. Now there's been many, many certain things that have happened during your sort of career in the Abbey. Uh, perhaps Simon, you'd like to take us one, two, one, two things that um, have been your experiences. Uh, well, first of all, there was, uh, well not first of all, one of the experiences was when I was cleaning out the jet's toilets. I was in the cubicle and uh, I cleaned out the jet's toilets and, and something just appeared in the corner of my eye. And I turned, and there was this shape there, and it was, it was a definite shape. Um, what I don't, I don't know, because obviously I, I didn't take that much of a notice, and then it suddenly went. Now, it was definitely there, though, just, just enough time for you to realise it was there, and then suddenly just disappeared. At that time, I just dropped everything and came upstairs and saw Chris. Chris, you told me earlier you, that you've um, had experience where you've been perhaps making this fire. Yeah, um, I often sit with my back to the bar and make the fire especially on when it's a cold night, we always have a fire on anyway. And more often than not, you always get the feeling that somebody is watching you and it makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up and it's, it's quite creepy. But there's always somebody stood near the bar watching you. Was it this bar where you told me about the beer mat situation? Yeah, this was when we first arrived here, before we actually had two cottages joined up um, to come in through the cottage and the pub. Um, we, came, we locked up one Sunday lunch when we actually closed one Sunday lunch, which was bliss. Um, and when we came back at seven, all the beer mats in this bar were all on the floor. And we'd set them up, as we normally do, with a four on a table and an ashtray, and they were all over the floor. And there were no windows open to blow them off? No, there's no windows in this bar. No, as you can see. Of course, this pub actually used to be um, a monastery or, or something akin yeah, to a monastery. Yeah, part of a monastery on this site, yeah. And what was this that you told me um, in our conversation before we started filming? The lady thought she saw you with the dog in the middle of the Oh, night. yes. My friend who lives over on the, in the White House on the field, um, she saw me the following day and she said, oh, she said, what were you doing on the field at 2 o'clock in the morning? She said, I could see you quite plainly stood under a tree. She said, do you have to take one of the dogs out? And I said, no. I said, it wasn't me. Definitely not me. I said, I wouldn't go out at 2 o'clock in the morning anyway. I'd just send Simon, really. So she, saw, she said, I definitely saw you. And I said, well, sorry, it wasn't me. Definitely not. I can tell you quite categorically it wasn't me on the field. I'm not that daft. I don't like it out there anyway. And there is actually stories of being a white lady out there who actually patrols, as it were, up and down. And what date does this building actually go back to as a monastery? Uh, this building originates 1147. 1147. Yeah. So there's, it's, there's a lot of history in this building and obviously in the, in the village and surrounding areas with the monastery being on this site. The Haunted Bell, probably the best preserved coaching inn in Derby. This is what coaching inns looked like in the 18th century. And because so much went on in coaching inns, and I'm talking of people living there, of, of highwaymen literally waiting in the buildings, watching people with the money, watching the mail coach coming in and out. Doctor's surgeries were held in coaching inns, um, veterinary surgeries, um, you name it, everything went on, courts were held here, and so of course there's, there's got to be ghosts. There's lots of ghosts in this building. There's a grey lady in the mortgage advice bureau here, or should I say the ghost of a grey lady, that uh, haunts the mortgage advice bureau here. There's a poltergeist in this bar here. Anyway, the best bit of this place, the haunted bedroom. After it was no longer a coaching inn, then the staff would sleep on the top floor, right at the top here, in the attic rooms. And room 29, the room on the right hand side, haunted by the ghost of a serving wench, reputedly murdered by the Jacobites, by Bonnie Prince Charlie's soldiers in 1745. But there's nothing to substantiate the story, but the girl in that room has been seen twice in connection with children. 
And here we are walking up the original staircase of the old bell, right to the top, to the gods. And at the top here of the landing, the notorious Room 29. Still got its original oak door and porcelain number. Here it is, 2929. Behind here is where the ghost of a young serving wench has been seen on frequent occasions. She was reputedly murdered by the Jacobites in 1745, but there are other stories to go with it. Um, a few years ago, a medium from Sheffield came here. She'd never been in this building before, and she went into this room, said there was a dreadful icy coldness about it, and she sensed a girl with a throat cut lying in the corner of the room. But she said even worse than that, next door she sensed a man a very evil man wearing a grey sort of overall with a bald head and he was standing in the corner of the room holding a knife dripping blood. Welcome to room 29, the haunted bedroom of the bell. An awful lot of folks on the ghost walk have heard about this room, but very few people have been in it. Very few people have seen in here. This is the room that is the most haunted part of this building. After it was no longer a coaching inn, this room was the bedroom of the landlord's son. The boy was a very bad asthmatic, and in the middle of the night, mum and dad heard the boy choking, coughing, and reaching. Dad rushed into the boy's room to find the boy out of bed bent forward, choking and coughing. But standing over him was a ghostly apparition of a girl wearing a white mob cap and starched apron. She was stood over the boy, patting him on the back, trying to relieve his suffering. Dad came in and the ghost vaporized and vanished. 30 years later, totally different family using this room again. The landlady was using it as a nursery. She was changing a baby's nappy in here and all she did was turn away from the baby to get either nappy pins or, or cotton wool and as she turned back she'd been substituted. There was another girl standing over the baby, a girl with a white mob cap and starched apron, bending over the baby to pick it up. Mother screamed and plunged her hands through the apparition to pick the baby up and draw it through the ghost. She clutched the baby close to her and ran out of the building, clutching the baby. As she turned back, she saw that the apparition was still there, bent over the baby, but of course, was no longer there. The mother left and changed nurseries. I think if it had been me, I'd have put in for a transfer and I'd have changed inns. Here we are above the stables in the bell yard. This area up here was used by the stable boys, the bestraw up here, and the stable boys, the lowest of the low of course, had to sleep on straw up here. And people have said that they've seen the ghost of a little boy sitting up here, looking at the people down here. This is uh, probably a room where either the coachman or the drivers would sleep at night if they were having an overnight sleep here in Derby before taking the coach the early morning coach in the morning. And through here, incredible door here, of course, um, cut out to fit the rafters. Pete, would you like to tell us one or two of your experiences while you've been landlord here? Uh, one experience I had uh, myself personally was late at night. Um, I was doing my stocks uh, as I do every Sunday night and I'm generally down here on my own. Lynn gives me a hand and she'll go upstairs and I'm generally down here on my own for an hour. One particular night um, I was a little bit late. It was getting on for quarter past one in the morning and where we are sat now in what we call the raised area, the stage area, uh, one of the seats that we, we see there, uh, chairs rather, um, actually moved just across this floor here, only a few inches 
probably less than a foot, for no apparent reason. And I just simply turned around and I just said, yeah, I won't be much longer, I'm going upstairs. I don't really speak to it, whatever it is down there. Other occasions, um, it, even when, when the weather's cold, they've got the heating on. There's always a cold presence in this area up here. Um, you, get a, you get a feeling of being watched uh, from from this stage area. Was it just the one chair that moved? Yes, just the one chair, that was all it was. So yeah. it couldn't have been a, a vibration of a, yeah. of a lorry? No or vibration that time of night. No. The streets are quiet that time of night, from about half past ten, eleven o'clock onwards. There's not much movement around here, just taxis coming and going. And certainly on that night, there was nothing knocking about anyway. How long have you been landlord at the New Zealand? Uh, coming up for 18 months now. Right, so um, at that stage, um, I'd like to have a chat with um, your partner Lynn because she has, a, I think, a theory on who the ghost might be. Yeah, possibly, And it will yeah. blend in so, with what so you've right. just been telling us about the, yeah. the, the um, yeah. spirit being happy to be here. Yeah, Lynn's done a lot more research into this than I have. And I've just... Um, um, it's related to the experiences to it that I've, I've felt myself. Pete was saying that he felt the spirit felt happy to be, if you like, staying in the pub. It felt happy to be in the premises. Now you've got a theory of, as to why that might be. T tell us what, what, what you feel you've, you've researched into, Lynn, and what you find you think the spirit might be appertaining to. Well, all I, all I know is from what um what the customers have told me, and it used to be a previous landlord, um, and he had a bit of trouble down the bottom end of the pub, and he had to turn, turn three um, lads out of the pub for causing trouble, and he used to sit behind the bar on a stool, and when he came back from chucking him out of the pub, he sat on his stool and he had a massive heart attack and was dead before he hit the floor. So he actually died in this bar? Mm, behind the bar. Right. So that would tie in really with what, uh, what Pete was saying. Um, if it is an ex-landlord, um, that is happy to be about the pub, he says that um, he feels the um, the spirit doesn't hold any animosity no, about the no, place. No, none at all. Um, and he's quite amicable, it doesn't mean anybody any harm. Oh no, he does play tricks sometimes, but that's about it. Can you call any particular tricks that he, you can think uh, of? I've put my fags on the end of the bar and I know where I've put them. I mean, I know I'm forgetful at the best of times, but I've put them on the end of the bar and um, I've come back and they're not there. So I've said, come on then, I only move playing games today, I've too much to do. And then I'll go away and then I'll come back and they're there again. So and he's put them back? He's put them back. Oh, it sounds like so, he's... Uh, yeah, I think he's a bit of a... Sounds like he's teasing you. Yeah, I think sometimes he is. I'm now in the tower, the bell tower of the haunted silk mill, England's first factory. Built in 1717, they used to employ children from the age of seven, from seven o'clock in the morning till five o'clock at night. And this bell tower is reputedly haunted by the ghost of a little boy who was kicked down these stairs for not working hard enough. He bled to death at the bottom. And they say that his ghost can still be heard crying and screaming. And the lift operates itself frequently. And before they leave at night, the staff used to check that lift to make sure there was no one inside it. It mysteriously burnt down in 1910. And the fire brigade managed to save only the bell tower. There used to be a bell at the top here that rang every morning at five o'clock and again at seven at night to let the workers know that it was time to go home. And even in 1840, they were still employing 104 children under the age of 13 to work in this dark satanic mill. This is called the Witcher's Cottage. It's a very old 17th century. Look at the look at the join here. Sorry. And um, very old, right? But the reason I bring everyone here is for the window. Now look at that. It's old. That is. It's actually, as you can probably see, it's brick bricked up, boarded up, and but now those bars are so old. They've been there for hundreds of years. Hundred, and I brought everybody down here for that. about two years ago. Ghost walk like this one, two young ladies on the ghost walk, 
muttering as we came down here. He's taken us past the witcher's cottage. And of course, straight away, witchers, because um, I, don't, I haven't told you this, but three witchers were executed at Derby. Two, the Bakewell witchers in 1607, and in 1597, the Stapen Hill witch from, would you believe, Stapen Hill, which was in Derbyshire in those days, died in the Derby jail where I took you earlier the night before her execution. So when someone mentions witches and cottages, it obviously, you know, makes me think, what, what's this to do with... Anyway, they said to me, absolutely nothing. We, we, we've nicknamed it the Witches' Cottage. We work here at Flint, Bishop and Barn. It's the solicitors. But they said, let me tell you that the reason we've called it the Witches' Cottage is because of the noises that come from this window. The scratching noises, as if something or someone is trying to gain release through this window. And apparently the girls working here, if they're working late at night, they will not come up this alleyway to get the car from the car park. <laughs> now, what I haven't told you is that I don't make anything up because most of the folks that have done this ghost walk are Derby folk. And they come more than once. And they'll say, I didn't say that last time. Well, that's rubbish because that's my dad's shop he's talking about. The next morning, this belongs to Folds Music Shop. I went in, I know Mr. Folds for 30 years. I went in and he took me all over this building without the word of a lie the room on the inside doesn't exist. There is no room that corresponds with that window. I've been in there, I've been in that room up there with three little archways there, I've been in this room here, which that's a window there look, with tie bars going through it, but without the word of a lie, that room does not exist. But ever since that fateful night, over two years ago, tonight being no exception, I've rapped heavily on that window to try and raise whatever happens to be lurking within. Tonight being no exception. Are you ready to run? <laughs> I've never had a reply, but I swear to you if I ever do, I'll be the first bugger to the bottom of that road, never mind anybody else. <laughs> This is the oldest pub in Derby, and there are probably more ghosts in this pub than, than any others. And Terry here, the landlord, has experienced quite a few of them, haven't you, Terry? Oh, terrible. When I first come here, my wife were upstairs, we were in bed, we couldn't get out of bed because there's somebody seemed to be on top of her. We the, had to move the bed. Uh, there's things going off downstairs in the, in the pub where the pumps are also turned off, pulling away at night, and all of a sudden the, the beer's turned off and everything. Just can't believe it. Things are happening so much. But the worst part is on these stairs. Well, when I cashed it one night at 12 o'clock, and I come up here with a till, turned all everything off, turned the lights off, walked up the stairs, and as I went, when I went to, as I'm coming up the stairs, there's a little girl stuck there, just up there, yeah, yeah just there, and uh, I took one look at her. I run past her, and I caught Linford Christie that night. I was shaking like a leaf. <laughs> but I'll tell you something. Um, Terrible feeling, but when I got in, when I got into the bedroom to the wife, I thought I was going to need hospital treatment because I tell you, I was absolutely shaking. Well, you've never seen one before. I was shaking like a leaf. I can see her now as though it were yesterday, dressed in one of them Holland long dresses, just with elbows, like that. Is that the first ghost you've seen? It is, yeah. But you, really? you, don't, you, you don't you don't get your feeling in the morning early in here, mm. in this pub down the cellar where you'll be going later on. Mm. You don't get a feeling you're on your own down there. There's. Uh, in that bottom room where they used to cut the bodies up and all that. You don't get a feeling, you don't get it on your own. In the back room there, it's the same thing. Very cold. Unfortunately, this is the only way down into the cellars of the dolphin. And we're now in the very low cellars of the Dolphin. This building goes back to 1530 and is the oldest pub in Derby. This narrow passage here leads us through into another part of the building, a much more sinister part of the building through here on the right-hand side. We're going to have to bend very low to get down through this little corridor and through here into what was 
a later addition, the 18th century part of the building. This is the most haunted part. Up above us was a doctor's house. And in the 18th century, doctors would pay big money for bodies to be delivered. This doctor was well serviced with churchyards all round him and he used to pay up to three guineas for freshly delivered bodies to be dropped here through the coal chute down onto the floor. One morning this doctor came downstairs to find a freshly delivered body still in its shroud lying in a heap here. He dragged it away to his dissecting table, laid it on the table, ripped open the shroud to find that the body was still alive. No one knew what happened, whether the doctor dropped dead from shock or whether he cut the body's throat and just left it in a, in a heap to die. But this is the haunted part, the real bad bit of this building. The poltergeist activity takes place here. Often there are barrels stored here and frequently the staff upstairs say or think that the beer's run out. So of course, they won't come down here alone. Two members of staff have to come in. And when they come in here, the beer hasn't run out at all. Phantom hands have turned off the gas taps in here. And this story goes back many, many years. This building, or the pub, belonged to my Uncle Jack. And even in the 1930s, when he owned it, he used to tell my dad stories of the ghost. And my dad used to tell me the stories of the beer barrels, wooden beer barrels in those days, of course, which weren't turned off. But Uncle Jack would come down in the morning to find one of the taps turned on and beer spilt all over the room, all over the floor here. So it's an old, old story. And one of the best stories was a lady who was a barmaid here and she was leaving, going to another pub. And she came down here at 11 o'clock one night to put the cellar to bed. And she said, I never bothered about it until last night, but I could sense there was something or someone down here with me. And as I left the building, I went up the stairs and I felt a pair of hands on my bottom pushing me up the stairs. It obviously wanted to send me on my way. And she said, I don't care how much money you pay me, I'd never ever go down into the cellar of the dolphin again. This is the George, or Lafferty's as it is now, from the front. Look how small it is. You see, you see how big it was at the back? You paid tax on the amount of pavement that you occupied, so you made it as small as you could at the front and took up as much as you wanted from the back. I'm actually kneeling on the area where the pit was dug underneath the George. You can see the line across here um, where the new concrete was put in. And this is the skull, the George skull. The skull that came out of this pit with 15 animal skulls, hundreds of strips of leather, shoes, just like this remains here of an old Viking shoe that came out from this pit in 1994. She's very brown. In fact, it's discoloured from the tannin because underneath me here is the midden or pit from a Viking leather workers workshop that was discovered when they put this drop in here for the beer barrels. She's the cause of all the ghostly activity that seems to take place now in this pub. The bottles that blow up down here in the cellar, glasses that blow up and taps and various items of the, uh, the barrels that fly across the room here where we are now. And of course, this is the skull, but you must remember that the rest of her is still resting beneath where I'm kneeling now. This is the table, the offending table, where so many ghostly occurrences have taken place in the cellar of the George. Um, one lad came down here and a metal bucket, a stainless steel bucket like this one, launched itself off this table and threw itself at his feet. It scared him to death, as you can probably well imagine. 
Another lad came down here and as his foot hit the bottom step of the staircase, seven of these plastic taps lying on this table launched themselves across the room towards his feet. He felt like a magnet. He's not frightened of ghosts and all he did was scoop them up, threw them back onto the table and shouted into the cellar, not tonight, thank you, it's Friday, I'm too busy. And another lad, the cellarman called Nathan, was in here, walked past this table, which had got lots of spirits on it, whiskey, gin and various other uh, bottles. And as he walked past it, a full vodka bottle blew up as he went by. Some people say perhaps he knocked it off and made the story up so he didn't have to pay for it. Perhaps he did, but he still got a piece of glass as a souvenir and he's become psychiatric nurse at, at Kingsway Hospital. Perhaps that's the effect it had on him. But this is the haunted bit of the cellar of the George. Well, like I was saying to you, I've been here, what, 10 years ago, mm. when it used to be called Jarrah St George. You're right. That's right. I came in, asked for a pint of, what it was, I, you're right. Served me a pint, and I stood. Do you see? Literally where I'm sitting yeah, now. Just stood there, having a pint. The bar stuff disappeared to do something. Yeah. And I stood there and I seen a glass just like bust off the shelf. But I thought, ah, it fell off, kind of thing. She did. The next minute, another one. Bang! And it was like a pint, and you're going, nah. And I thought, yes, that time, yes. And I just left my pint and I was gone. I was bothered how much it cost me. I thought, no, nah, I was just out of the place. And I tell you something. I've always been in here, and when you come in here, you, you feel the coldness. As soon as you walk in, it's cold. And the same as places in Berlin. I've been in the Berlin, and that's been the same. You know, it's it, oh, old. You feel it's very old again. Well, like I said, been here ten years ago. It was or a bit longer. But like I said, it's but the glasses then used to be there. It used to be a bit further up when it came up. I went nah. Same things. Nah, it just fell off. And the next one bang again. And I thought, time to go. <laughs> Got that old sharp, one, sharp exit. We're now in the bar area of the Crescent Inn on Wild Street in Derby. With me is Jason Riles, a fairly new licensee of the pub, but since he's been here, Jason has witnessed many, many strange occurrences. Well, there's been an instance where I've been sat upstairs in the living room about maybe 2 a.m. in the morning, and I've heard a lot of disturbance in the kitchen. So I've gone down to the kitchen, because there's been a lot of rattling, thinking someone was breaking in, maybe. And then when I've got there, I've like noticed it's actually the pots and pans on the draining boards cracking against each other. And then when turning the lights on, it's all gone stopped, sort of stopped and all gone quiet again. Very eerie, I should imagine, that time yeah, of the morning. Yeah, two in the morning when you're sat on your own, it is. Yeah. And then there's been quite a few occasions from down here cleaning up about one in the morning, 12 o'clock, one in the morning, cleaning up and forever hearing like doors closing and like footsteps. Like I've been sat here and a locked door has opened itself wide and then shut itself and locked itself again. It actually unlocked itself, opened yeah. and locked itself again. It was, phys it was physically locked and then it opened itself and then closed itself again and there was another person here when that happened as well. Wasn't there something about some glasses falling off the shelf or something? Yep, yeah, that's when this has happened in the day as well. There's been plenty of customers that have seen pint pots. Sometimes, well, probably nine out of ten times, it's two fall off together, like at opposite ends of the bar. It's like that's happened. I've seen it happen two, three times, and Matt, the other landlord, he's had that happen quite a few times. and then customers have seen that because that's happening in the day, not just at night. But often you hear the pint pots rattling against each other at night. Sounds like you've got two ghosts, both wanting to drink at the same time. Well, that's when we spoke to a few people about, because we do know that quite a few people have died in this pub over the recent years. And they said, like, that the ex-landlady lives just over the road and she's seen a lot of things as well. She's spoke about it. And so she knows, she's like, apparently my bedroom's supposed to be the worst. <laughs> But well, that's the thing, I haven't really seen anything in my bedroom or heard anything in my bedroom.
But Mo, who's the ex-landlady, she said that was the worst of the rooms in the house, but not to see anything there yet. So the most haunted room by theory is the one that hasn't been yeah, affected? Yeah, the one that hasn't, that's my bedroom. So touch wood, it doesn't, it doesn't happen too much in my room. But you often hear footsteps upstairs and like doors kind of closing. Right, well thank you Jason. That's Jason from the Crescent Inn. What do you think? Are there some spirits here? Why not pop in and have a drink and see if you can find them yourselves? Murders, suicides, accidents, battles, executions. Their time hadn't come. And I think, I believe, that the energy used by this body, by the brain, the electronic impulses given off by the brain moments before death can be so immense in resisting death that I believe that the, the events just before death can actually be recorded into the fabric of a building. Stone, bricks, woodwork, plaster, perhaps even the soil can contain a recording which for some reason, and I don't know why, can be released again. You can see it again. Some people see it again. A um, little bit like knocking a cassette player on the floor. Sometimes the jolt causes it to come on again. And a lot of builders, demolition men, see ghosts because they're di disturbing a building. They're knocking it about. They're jolt making it, doing something to it that, that, that the shock makes this recording happen again. And this is why you often see things coming through the wall because it doesn't, doesn't know that the wall picked up. Um, you see, it sounds a bit nonsensical, but if I told you that I could record last week's football match, Derby County football match, on, on a piece of plastic tape and put it into a, 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 a slot, a video, yeah, press the play button or the replay button and all those footballers would come out on that screen again, I'd be dragged away to windmill pit and burn to the stake. Yeah, rubbish, nonsense, you can't do that. Well, of course, you know you can. What I'm saying is, if there's enough energy involved, is it not possible that you can record onto other fabric other than magnetic cassettes, videotape, mini disc, CD, photographic paper? In other words, the fabric of a building can contain a recording which you see again. But of course, the recording is always replayed at exactly the same spot as where it was made, which of course sometimes causes ghosts to look to be headless, legless. It's because the building's changed so much in 300 years since the death took place that the floor is sometimes lower than it, or the road is below. Now there's a very famous incident in York when a young lad was digging a trench in a cellar in York. Fifteen Roman soldiers came through the wall and in front of them a centurion on his horse. They were all legless. He went upstairs, changed his brown corduroys, told his mates of the story and they went down into the cellar and they excavated underneath that building and 18 inches below the cellar floor they found the old Roman road going right under the building and in other words he'd seen a replay of the last few moments of those Roman soldiers before their death as they were tramping along the Roman road with their sandaled feet but the road of course was 18 inches below the cellar floor which cut them off at the knee and made them appear to be legless if it's headless ceiling's lower. If you've got the guts to run upstairs into the attic, you may see a head <laughs> bobbing along the floor of the attic with a body below. But it's only a theory. But it, it, it holds, I believe, quite a lot of water. But in eight and a half years, no one's come up with a better one. Tonight could be the night. Anybody? Any takers? No. On we go. You're in for the night, girls. There's no escape. Right, you're uh, you're now sitting in the old original stables of the Tiger Inn. 1973, long time ago, through the wall where the corner of the marketplace and the corn market is, the site of the Royal Bank of Scotland. Now, they were demolishing an old building old 18th century building. It used to be Smith's clocks. Some of you may remember it. it. told you the time all over the world on the side of that building. They demolished it. There was nothing left. Piles of rubble on the floor. The workmen had either gone home or gone to the bell for a quick pint to settle the dust. And they'd left one chap behind, sort of generally clearing up the, the area. He was an Irishman. Honestly, pr promise you. He was walking towards this pile of rubble which had settled. The dust had settled. And unbeknown to anyone else, including him, a doorway had appeared. 
a square doorway and he could see straight down through this doorway into the cellars of the old building and sitting on the floor of the cellar about nine feet down was a little boy a little boy of about six years of age wearing rags the Irishman spoke to him he went up to the hole and he shouted into the hole he shouted what are you doing there little boy <laughs> just, just as you would of course um, and the little lad shouted back up to him I live here now I don't think the boy meant I live here in the cellar I presume he meant I live here in this house which of course had been there up until a few hours earlier they both vanished the Irishman to the bell for a couple of very stiff whiskies. <laughs> he brought a couple of his mates back because their first priority, to be honest with you, was a little boy was locked, trapped or had fallen into the... and there was no one there. The Derby Evening Telegraph came, wrote a very lengthy article on the ghost and took a photograph. We've still got a copy of that photograph of a, of a newspaper reporter peering into the inky blackness of that hole, which is how we reconstructed the little Sammy um, diorama in the ghost room. And that was 20, 1973, 20, 28 years ago, and he still plays havoc with the Royal Bank of Scotland. Things that happen in that bank still to this day. Um, I could keep you here for the next half hour, telling you stories of things that happened in the Royal Bank of Scotland, but I won't do that. But we've had various things. I used to refer to him as Little Reggie. I've been told he was nicknamed Little Reggie. One night during the ghost walk, a lady sitting over here said, that's not true. And I thought, oh. Your worst nightmare. It's almost I said, I'm sorry, what do you mean? She said, we don't call him Little Reggie. We call him Sammy. I work there. And her mum had been a cleaner there. And she said, everything you say is true. The lift operates itself, papers float, coffee cups fly off desks. And he was very fond of the five pound weights and he used to skim them across the counter. And her mum, a cleaner in the Royal Bank of Scotland, had seen him twice in the basement of the Royal Bank. So on both occasions, she said, she saw this little boy of about six wearing rags. He turned away from her, went towards the wall, and was just swallowed up, just vanished through the wall. And mum wasn't frightened of him. She was one of the few cleaners that worked on their own in the Royal Bank of Scotland. We also had one of the managers when it was Williams and Glynn's Bank, and he said, I never saw anything, but I will tell you that we got through an above average amount of cleaners in the Royal Bank of Scotland. And only... Three weeks ago, we had a lady sitting here at this table who had been a cleaner at the Royal Bank of Scotland. She'd seen him, she'd sensed him, she, she, she described him in great detail, a little boy of about six. She used to see him in the basement. She actually saw him sliding down the banisters in the Royal Bank of Scotland. I have seen my only ghost in here, in this jail, uh, just over a year ago. It was 20 past three in the afternoon, Friday afternoon, daylight. The phone went. went through this hatch. It was distinctly grey and not at all ghost-like. I put the phone down. It frightened me, I have to say. I put the phone down, came to the front of the counter and shouted, excuse me. I thought someone had actually come in off Friargate. There was nobody there. I went back to the phone and said, Darren, I've just seen a ghost. I then said, I may well, well, I may well stay on the phone longer than I anticipated. And he said, why? I said, because when I put this phone down, I'm on my own with what's just come in here. And I chatted for a bit and I eventually put the phone down and thought, obviously, it's time to leave came out into the corridor expecting to see it, expecting it to have materialised into something, but it hadn't. I've never seen it again, but I do expect one day after seeing it to actually see it in here again. Stopping you here basically because um, the, the music is loud, but they do turn it off when I talk to you, but I need to warn you before you go in. There's a ghost of a lady, a Victorian lady, in there. She's always preceded by a very strong smell of lavender, right? She's only ever seen upstairs. The ladies' toilets are upstairs, girls. 
And I must warn you, I kid you not, things have happened. Honestly, I haven't told you this, I don't make things up. Um, all we knew about this place, when we did the book in 1995, there was an old lady seen upstairs, long, a very strong smell of lavender, and then she appeared. And then, um, it must be three years ago, doing the city centre ghost walk, coming back along Bold Lane, there's a lady on the ghost walk, rushes up to me and says, oh, aren't we going in Seymour's? Aren't, aren't we doing... I said, no, we, we don't do it on, um, on the city centre ghost walk. We do it because we do a haunted pub crawl as well. This isn't it, by the way. But, I mean, that's five city centre pubs and we stagger from one pub to the next, uh, looking for the spirits behind the bar. Um, but, um, so anyway, she said, oh, that's a shame because she said, I've seen a ghost in Seymour's. I, I used to be the manageress and I used to live upstairs. She said I, I was uh, divorced and I lived on my own. And we had this old lady that used to appear, but she never appeared before, before there was a very strong smell of lavender and then we'd see her. And she said, I'd be, I'd be clearing up from the night before, vacuuming up upstairs and there'd be a real strong smell. And I'd be, I'd be, that'd be the cue, she said, I'd be looking round and she'd be there at the top of the stairs. This woman, large as life, not ghostly. Victorian woman, and then I'd look back and she'd, she'd be gone. Or she'd, I'd be serving somebody at the bar upstairs, and there'd be a crowd of people, and there'd be an extra person in the crowd. It'd be that woman, this, this Victorian woman. And then it'd get to the till, turn back, she'd gone. She said she never did anything horrible. She was never stood at the bottom of my bed at three o'clock in the morning when the wind was howling and the twigs were, and branches were rattling at the outside. And, Ice cold hands would reach down. Nothing like that at all. She said all she the only mischievous thing she ever did, she used to pinch the waiter's friends, which is a, a corkscrew bottle opener night, that sort of thing. And she said they'd go missing. And then a few months would go by and on the bar upstairs there'd be this real neat pile of waiters' friends piled up one on top of the other. And she said the waiters would say, Hey, that's mine and they'd pick it up and back in the pockets and and then a few months would go by and they'd all stop going again and then to be a part. That's, she, that's the only thing that she ever did that was was mischievous. Right, that's the end of phase two. Phase three. I was doing a haunted pub crawl about 18 months ago. Stood down there by the fire, did the same story, and I said, and there was this lady that used to be um, manageress. And, and a woman sitting here on the ghost walk says, that was me. And I said, why didn't you make yourself known? She was on the, was on the pub crawl. She said, well, I didn't lie. I said, oh, come on, you tell them the story, never mind me. But it's not every night that you get the person that, that, that you're talking about on the ghost walk. So I said, you t so she told them the whole story, just as I've told you. And at the end of it, she said to me, you remember I told you that upstairs above the fireplace used to be a photograph of the lady, of the ghost. She said, well, that's it. And that picture through there, is this, le this lady said to me, that's not a likeness. That's not a Victorian lady that looks like the ghost. She says, that is the woman that I used to see upstairs here. And she's the most, well, when you have a look at her, you'll get quite a shock. because she's, she's an evil looking lady to say the least. And she's, the eyes, they're, they're, wherever you are in this building there, she's a, she's a photographic version of the Mona Lisa, only she ain't smiling. This building also is haunted. This was Derby Grammar School. It's the only Tudor building in the centre of Derby. It was built in 1554. And all of Derby's famous boys went to school here, including two priests, two Catholic priests, both captured, both hanged, drawn and quartered. One of them was found hiding in a priest hole at Padley Hall. When I opened this building eight and a half years ago, I thought we need to tell this story of religious persecution, priest holes. And while they were renovating the building, I got the builders to dig a priest hole under the building. They found three skeletons under the floor. We've obviously disturbed something, just like they did at the George Lafferty's, because we have a lot of poltergeist activity in this building. Footsteps, bumps and bangs, someone walking on the landing upstairs. Doors opening at the back here. And four years ago, Easter, we had surveillance cameras put in all over the building. And they worked through the night putting the cameras in. And at half past three in the morning, two of the workmen came downstairs to me. I was making the tea. Said to me, is this place haunted? And I said, well, it has its moments. Why? He said, well, the whole time we've been upstairs, 
putting the camera in, there's been a little boy standing in the corner watching him. Shoulder length, blonde hair, about 12 years of age, and a leather sort of body warmer with no sleeves. And he said the thing that upset us was that he was watching us. His head was on one side and he was inquisitively watching us. Now, it really upset him. They, neither of them would be upstairs on their own. That was four years ago. I've never seen him. And I'll be quite honest with you, I don't know him. Because I spend a lot of time in here on my own at night and day the time. And I really don't wish to see anything. But staff have. People have seen things. And basically, nothing happened in this building before we found those bodies or the bones literally there under the floor. But I mean, you come in now. The Jones thing! <laughs> Anybody need the toilet? You're actually here because you saw the American Discovery Channel and you actually saw the Derby Ghost Wall. Yes. On it. Yes. And how long ago was that? Well, it was about a month ago. It was uh, in January, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember it was uh, it was a Saturday. And it was Christmas around Christmas. It was after Christmas. It was real cold outside, and we were uh, contemplating coming because my parents live here. Right. And then uh, we were watching it. And they're like, hey, look, that's in England. And they said, Darby. And they said, like, you know, most on the town of England. And they had that one with the girl that comes through here and she sees that, that man. Yeah. And then we said, hey, that, that's a good place to go. So I told my parents, that's where I wanted to go. And you made a special journey to come mm -hmm. to Darby. Yep. From Texas. From Texas, San Antonio. From San Antonio. San Antonio. Gosh, <laughs> that's amazing. So what do you think of it? What do you think of the for? Was it worth coming? Oh, it was great. It was great. Especially coming in here and seeing all the original stuff and everything. Yeah. And especially after seeing it on... On, on that TV. Yeah, I see everything that, that was on that TV. Yeah. It was on that... Uh